Yeah, yeah we got nine. So this is the whole group. So we're officially kicked off and ready to roll. So like I was uh, saying, we're basically going to begin with uh, cleaning and uh, trimming the tree. So what you're really looking for is any, like there's some pine needles, like that doesn't necessarily need to be here, but you're looking for any dead pieces, uh, any, any dead foliage, any branches that like just have, you know, dead stuff. It's very, very straightforward. But yeah, usually what I do at this point is I will start at the very base and just systematically work up and find the branching. So I'll trim some of these roots in here that are kind of exposed to encourage like the healthy roots to grow underneath the soil. And so just starting at the base and then working my way, my way up until I hit the first branch that I encounter. So then whenever I hit the first branch, I'll just start trimming from that branch all the way out until that entire branch is, uh, is pruned. So for this specific first branch here, there's definitely some growth that goes straight up at a branch junction. So at that branch junction, I'm just going to remove all that growth that grows straight up. So there's a dead branch and then a small, tiny juvenile, juvenile tip. So I removed all that and then just continue to move out throughout that branch to see what else is dead. And then whenever you encounter something that's like kind of elongated dead branch, instead of trimming it at the junction, you want to leave this as a candidate for, um, for your dead wood and for your shari and for your gin options. So instead of cutting that entirely, I'll just kind of trim it back a little bit to make like a very defined like little uh, stump there. And then later on, you can uh, turn that into a little gin feature. I'll talk about that towards the end. So within the approach of styling, or sorry, trimming, we're essentially going to use some very uh, simple like uh, binder tip scissors and just kind of go through and make the little cuts wherever you see like the imperfections. So as I'm continuing through this spot, I can see where essentially there are off of this first branch that I'm uh, trimming up and cleaning. Okay, um, what are we missing? Zoom crashed. Zoom crashed. Yeah, see, like, I think we left the... What happened? Yeah, give it a second. You still have video footage rolling, right? Yeah, it's still recording everything. Okay. Um, but let's see if we can. So we seem to have a little bit of technical difficulty with all our Zoom participants and the uh, main feed into Zoom, so we'll get that squared away. Yeah, yeah I know Zoom, Zoom, Zoom just crashed us. It's right there. So on this range, you can no, come see okay. that. Okay. There are one, two, three, four, five, five nodes all whirling from this one junction here. So we're going to trim that down to two to set up healthy bifurcation because that'll with, uh, with lots of nodes uh, emerging from a single point. You'll end up with uh, lots of reverse taper at that junction as it grows out. So I'm going to take off the one that grows straight up. There's one that extends out further that I do enjoy because it bifurcates again. So I'll keep that one. There's this one that kind of comes back in. It looks a little damaged. From whatever reason, maybe it got dead. It's like it's bent. So we're going to take that one off in favor of the stronger, healthier growth. And let me know if you need me to do anything. I'm just going to keep trucking. So then that leaves these two points originating off of this uh, this main branch. So I like that. And uh, we're going to remove this other one that's moving up to the top. 
So maybe we can one of those to essentially create like a cool little like little tiny spikes above that, that branch. So I'm almost done with this first branch here as far nice. as anything it goes. Again, you're looking for anything that grows in the crotches, you're looking for anything that grows down or up directly. And yeah, just kind of pruning it and cleaning it up, and then we'll come back through and do a little bit more cleaning to it uh, once we wire it and put it into position. So when I'm talking about stuff that grows down, you can see there's this little pad here. This little spruce of a, of a thing growing, so I'm just going to take this one lateral growth that's growing directly down from the motion out. Same thing here, you can see there's two little nodes. Straight down. So then, whenever you look at the side of the branch here, it's very on the bottom. Yeah, we are coming back, guys. Something is up with this thing. I can hear what you have to say. Yeah, I think we're having a little well, issue. This is what happened. Okay, that's exactly what happened. Okay. Um. Hello, we're back. I think you can see the screen again. How are you guys doing with your cleaning? Any questions? Any situations? Any whirls? Any dead branches or anything? Okay, they can see but not hear yet. Okay, so for the video purposes, I'm going to continue to move up to the second branch from the trunk line. And as I move up, I'm finding more smaller dead pieces, old growth in the crotch area, and then clearing out some of these bottom growing things. And there's a crotch growth where you can see it clearly bifurcates here but then this middle piece is growing right in between it. So we want to just eliminate that growth to help push all that energy to the tips. Okay. Yes, yeah, so these are, I know I said it in the description of the workshop, but these are Chinese junipers. And I'm not sure exactly what the cultivar is, but they, at least what I was told, was they're a specialty cultivar. So they're not just like your Home Depot or your Lowe's nursery stock junipers. Um, and you can see a little bit of interest that is different in the, in like the foliage, whenever it grows out and matures, it seems to have some like interesting texture and patterns that I don't see on the other chinensis. The thing that really catches my eye with these specific specimen is the um, the history behind them. So there's a there's a, a nursery out in California, and I'm not sure exactly which one it was, but the Deep Forest Gallery in Dallas. They worked with this nursery out in California as they were shutting down to obtain like hundreds and hundreds of these uh, pre bonsai that were actually like trained with bamboo. So on some of them uh, with, where there are bends, uh, you might actually see like a piece of bamboo that's like where the juniper whip was wrapped around it to help increase like this sort of motion in the main trunk line. So that's, uh, that's something that a nursery practitioner uh, applied as a technique to these things um, many years ago, and then you're seeing the effects growing out with all this interest and movement as these kind of go up. So within the interesting characteristics of this specific specimen, I think, like you see a lot of back and forth movement, and um, there's not a whole lot of taper interest, so they're going to be kind of like uh, more whimsical and like uh, dancing style trees instead of your strong and uh, stout, powerful 
junipers that exist out there. With the dancing characteristic, you, you can have um, some really interesting opportunities to create like Shari or that uh, dead and live interplay up the, up the trunk line. So keep that in mind as you uh, trim your tree and like explore the primary and secondary branches to really think about like how you might want to set up or what a cool shari structure would look like. So then down in this sector of this tip, we have the two bifurcations, but then we have this like uh, other growth that's growing laterally right at the spot where the bifurcation needs to persist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the lateral growth to just encourage, I mean, it wasn't necessarily in the crotch, right? It was growing on the outside, but I want to just keep it to a bifurcating um, pattern here. So that's kind of really what you're focusing on when you're trimming and looking at the, at the continuation of bifurcation. You got any questions as you guys work through your trees? Does anybody know how I can get the frames video larger? We use different, I don't know if you assume. Yeah, you should be able to switch it to speaker view instead of like the, the Brady Bunch view. And then you can pin one participant's video. So I think you would like, yeah, find that speaker view and then pin it. Yep. Yes, sir. So same thing here out towards this tip. There's just like lots of lateral growth. So I've already cleaned the stuff on the bottom mostly. So then you're just going to kind of go through and see where you want to like establish the bifurcation because like you don't want uh, T growth for the whole thing. So like for one side where there's a T joint, I'll cut one side. And then for the other side where there's a T joint, I'll cut the other side, kind of like an alternating pattern to help like space out where some of that growth comes in. I won't trim it too much because like I said, we'll come, whenever we wire it, we'll position the branch and then that might um, open up some new opportunities to kind of clean it up. And just generally speaking, take your time and enjoy the tree. It is a living being, so you know, get to know it, breathe, and think about you know, where it came from and how long it's been here and all the fun things related to like another living being. Uh, there's no specific rush on getting all this work done today. I just want to go through the basic outlines and the, out, the flow of an approach for styling and setting up the initial design on a juniper to take it from pre-bonsai to a bonsai. Even if we only like focus on two branches, the same process is applicable for the whole tree. So just kind of enjoy that. So I've, I've just trimmed through about two branches to clean those two branches up. So I'm going to continue on to the third one. Just checking my work to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, so from a total branch structure, I've basically trimmed this lower lower portion here. So now we're going to keep rotating and I'll tackle this uh, longer, longer set out here. So first thing that jumps out at me is this dead wood. Just kind of trim it back a little bit. What's the like consensus as far as everyone's experience with working with junipers? I know Jacob earlier mentioned that he doesn't usually work with junipers because the needles irritate the skin. How about how about the rest of you guys? Yeah. I've seen some of your junipers, Morgan. They're sweet.
who was asking that question? It's rusty. Rusty, cool. Yeah, okay, so you're asking about the upward growth on the branches? Yeah. Is it interesting? Do you want to keep it, or are you, are you wondering if it's the one to get rid of? Yeah, so there's also the other option to where, like, so on this branch here, you can see how these things are growing up, like, like you're recognizing. Um, but what we can do is we can take fine wire and essentially just lay them out flat to make them like more lateral and have a pad that comes out of it. So you don't want to clear like all the upward growth, but you're looking for like in like in that whirl scenario that we saw earlier, where you have like five nodes coming out of a single point, you definitely want to get rid of the upward growth on that one, unless it like um, is part of the design. You definitely want to um, definitively clear the bottom of the branch to where you have like a very smooth um, defining bottom line because that's going to help set up and build the like the silhouette to the cloud of a pad that you're creating. And then whenever you're working through tree like uh, cleaning and pruning like here is an example of another like whirl scenario where I have like the main growth uh, line here is out to this tip but then right at this juncture, there's you know, one growing out this way and then two growing up to the top. So I'm going to take the back one off that's growing up to encourage the growth out towards the ends. And then that leaves three, three nodes from that one spot. So then there's the one that's growing straight up or the ones that are growing out and down. So I'm going to grow, like clip the one that's growing straight up in favor for the two that are growing out. Yeah, so Rusty, if you're not sure, I would say like wait till you put wire on it and then that'll help uh, make that like decision a little bit more clear. So this branch is pretty neat over here because we have like right off of the main trunk line, we have like a trifurcation really early on. I'm trying to figure out which one I like want to remove, but essentially Right in this spot here is a good opportunity for, and I'm not sure how well you're able to see it, um, but it's a good opportunity to create some gin work. So it depends on what that looks like. Uh, as we, yeah, it's gonna be a sweet little gin up in there. We'll see which one of those three gets ginned at, at the end, but I've identified a, a really good spot where you'll see the like upper canopy like go out towards towards this direction and then two of them will go down and then the third one will like interplay with it and it'll be deadwood. So that'll be pretty sweet. Yeah, so then from these um, making their way to Dallas from California um, at the Deep Forest Nursery, we were like the Austin Bulldog Society Club was going to have these be for the LSBF convention this year. And alas, the convention got canceled, as you could imagine. So we, um, as a club, are, a lot, are basically making these available for, for a workshop. So that's pretty cool. We've sourced them like in 2018 as a club. So they've been in Austin for <laughs> about two and a half years now, I guess, maybe. And 
essentially the only real root work that have been done on them, they went from like a like the typical one and a half gallon nursery container with just dirt and soil. They got taken out of that and then put into this pond basket with some expanded shale and pumice and pine bark mix. So essentially they were like up potted and I believe they were up potted like towards the end of last year. And then they've shown like good, healthy, strong growth. And essentially like you could consider like taking them out of this basket and putting it into a container, like a, like an oversized container this year, or you could leave it in the basket uh, throughout the course of 2021. And then definitely you'd have enough root strength to push it into a smaller container come like 20, 2022. And you do that work around um, March, like or like in Austin at least, you do that work around March, March or April. Summer Roland, how are you guys doing? Pretty good. Okay. Cool. Just cleaning, cleaning it out so I can see like through it. You know what I mean? See some maybe spacing branches and all that. Absolutely. Oh, you got a nice one, Roland. Thank you. I don't know where the fuck is. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna wait till he goes on a bathroom break. <laughs> Just snag it. You're like, oh yeah, I did a lot of work to yours. Can't you tell? <laughs> it looks really different. <laughs> So on this third branch that I'm really working on, there's like this earlier growth that doesn't really like seem like it has a lot of ramification to it versus the other stuff. It's kind of longer, leggier. It like comes back from up here where like kind of that cluster is. So I'm actually going to like take that one off entirely just to kind of give strength to the, the direction. And this will get cleaned up a lot whenever we wire. So it's going to get in the way of the wiring of this branch. So I'm moving up to the like to the upper portion of this tree now. So we're looking at finishing off this sector up here. Since we're this tall on this one, um, like on this upper like level, I'm gonna go ahead and just call out that like this growth out here is really long, and we can probably cut it back just because for your, I mean that's like your apex growth almost. But then you also have this one that's really long, so you have two or three things that are really tall up here, as you can see within this specific tree. So there's lots and lots of movement. And then, like I was talking about earlier, I'm not sure how well you can get in on here, but there's this sector where you can see where there's lots of back and forths on this uh, portion of that primary trunk line. And essentially, Essentially, that's where this upper whip was like wrapped around the bamboo um, pole for training purposes. So this like looks like it's got some really um, raunchy reverse taper, and it does. It's true. And what we what we'll have to do to fix that kind of flaw through here is essentially like create a shari to where the shari cuts through that reverse taper and like divides it up. And then you can take that up to like maybe one of these really long branches to make like a like a, an extended gin at the top. So that's where you would you know pick one of these non desirable uh, upper canopy long growth um, leads, cut it back, gin it, and then connect that to a shari that goes lower in the trunk to kind of address that that character flaw. So we'll see some of that work here towards the back half of the second hour. Still doing some trimming and cleaning on this upper portion though. Just as I get through there and look at it, I, I see that opportunity and think about, you know, think about that into the overall design. And since I up pot them, feel free to like essentially move some of that top soil around so you can try to get to some nabari. So you can kind of see 
you know, where your trunk line might go. It could be a couple of inches lower in the soil, now that I'm thinking about it, than, um, than initially there. Like the rocks and the pumice and expanded shell were like up to where my fingers were. So I've cleaned it back a little bit to get to some of those initial roots to see where that is. But we'll get into more of that after we're done with um, the cleaning and, printing and pruning. I just heard Summers uh, moving some rocks around. It was like, oh yeah, I did that before we started. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So good question, Brandon. I would say like definitely like you, if you get a pair of like needle nose pliers, like you can like pinch at that. I mean, I even see like a little piece of bamboo up in here. So like you could get the needle nose pliers out and just kind of try to pinch at it and erode it. The bamboo is so um, frail and fragile right now that it just kind of like would break. So you can pick at it and try to get it out. Whenever you're creating the shari, there are some like hand carving tools like this just like with an edge on it. So you could use some of that to like kind of help, you know, just kind of remove it. So here's the like little tiny piece of bamboo that I was talking about within this specific example. But it should be able to get removed with the needle nose pliers. Will you repeat the specific question, Brandon? I heard what I heard the idea. Is it towards the top of the tree? Yeah, I mean, so like, what um. I will leave it up to you to decide specifically, like for the top of the tree, like I have these two that I'm thinking about keeping and cutting back a little bit, and then I have this third one that's really long and overextended, so I'm, I'm feeling like, t like turning some of this into, into a gin, at least for this one, even though there is lots of healthy growth on it. So, um, but when in doubt, like I would say, kind of reserve and leave more foliage on it, and then you can like watch it grow out, and then make a more informed decision like next time you iterate on it through the next styling session. Uh, I mean the strength without a doubt the strength of the foliage like your uh, the strength of a juniper is in the foliage so you're gonna want to like leave leave a decent amount, um, like you, as you can see on this one, I, I'm probably removing maybe 20, 30 percent, but if you're starting to remove 50 percent, then you just might want to like consider being a little bit lighter on the amount of pruning that you're doing. But these are really strong specimens, so I've uh, worked on a few of them since I got them, and like I've, tr I've pruned some, like cleaned up some really extensively, and they they grew back and filled out again. So it's uh, it's really hard. These are very forgiving beginner uh, junipers to kind of get your your feet wet with how to take care of the juniper. <laughs> yes, without a doubt. Roland said, make sure they get sunlight. So I even have a like they were in a very sunny part of my yard, but they didn't get as much sunlight as they would want in someone else's yard. So if you have it, give them full sun. I would like give them maybe a couple weeks of shaded environment um, after doing some like pruning on it. So I kind of dappled sunlight for a couple weeks after this work and then from there you can like, like transition them into the full sun. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, freezes was the question. Should we, how should we protect this work during freezes? And 
I mean, definitely if you have a greenhouse, I would keep it in the greenhouse. But at the same time, pending any super hard freezes, it should be good. You know, the 40s, the 40 temperatures aren't a problem. Like if it just gets below 32 for an extended period of time with wire on it, it could be. It could be like you might lose some branching. But for the most part, just out of honesty, this, these are a really hardy species, like are a really hardy tree and Austin doesn't get too cold. So I haven't seen any problems with the, like these being in my yard for a long, for multiple years. So on this, at this upper node here, definitely have like this cool little downward growth that I probably will turn into a gin, but we'll leave it for now to see what else we're gonna do. So we're hitting the, thir the first 30 minutes so we'll, f we'll uh, take a little bit more time. I'll finish um, the trimming and cleaning of this specimen here, and then we'll get into a little bit of more like the design talk. Do you need water or anything, Brandon? There's a couple bottles right here, actually. Thank you, Summer. Yeah, really excited for Austin Bonsai Society this year. Already a strong start. Got Todd Schlafer kicking it off with that cool one seed. I think we'll have a finalized program to share with everyone. But I don't know. I'm not on the board anymore, so it's all up to, to the fearless leadership of Summer and Roland. And Ruan. I got a confirmation from Sterlitz and um, Mike Hagedorn. Yeah. Hagedorn's great. It'd be really cool to hear him talk about his book. Nice. I got it for Christmas too. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Roland. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I should have worn them today. Should have worn my bonsai socks. Yeah, we'll see what officially happens, but unofficially, if it is Michael Hagedorn coming to talk about bonsai hearsay. Well done, board. Well done. He was supposed to do a book tour this year. Yeah. And like ride the Greyhound circuit. <laughs> around the uh, like the United States and talk about books so top is very bushy lots of crotch growth though so that makes it pretty straightforward as far as what gets removed and like I'm saying, you can like you can continue to do more of the <clears throat> trimming and cleaning as we wire because that like once you put the wire on, you'll just run into some situations where the wire is going to run right over a foliage pad, and you know you want to keep a clean wire, so you remove the foliage pad or some of it out of the way as you set the wire. Pretty good beginner trees. Yeah. Mike saw them. Mike Garza. He saw them from afar and was like, those, let's get those, a whole lot of them. <laughs> Which was actually a technical term for 12. <laughs> Not like a literal whole lot, but an actual lot. So yeah, uh, like the Dallas Bonsai Society collaborates with Deep Forest Gallery. And Deep Forest Gallery is kind of like a private, 
landscaping company, for lack of a better term, who then loves bonsai. So like they'll somehow get large landscape shrubs and or access to something and then they'll do Japanese gardens and they'll offer some some bonsai stock to people. But they had auctions uh, for a couple like for a couple years <laughs> where they would just have like one seed junipers and all these cork, uh, cork, arc, uh, cork bark oaks, apologies. And all sorts of stuff, so they're a cool little group. They're by appointment only though, so you have to contact them beforehand. I always buy them off. I'll buy bonsai. <laughs> <laughs> you got the awesome ones decided to clean me out. <laughs> you guys, you guys got the rest of them. <laughs> yeah. We can we can figure something out though. It's feeling pretty clean up here. A couple more sectors right on the apex where there's just lots of crotch growth and whorls. So I'm almost done with the trimming. How about you guys? Um, I'm doing pretty good. Cool. Okay, there's still some stuff that'll pop out here and there, but for the most part, you can definitely see more space opened up on this tree. You can see a lot more of that, that movement of that primary line. And then those parts that really stick out are very apparent. So, tidy up a little bit and then we'll get on to the, the next portion. All right, so for the next portion, we're gonna talk about styling, design, and mostly like finding the front. So, this was, introduced to me as a, an objective method through the, at a convention workshop with Brian Neal, was doing the Kishu Juniper LSBF convention workshop at the Houston Bonsai Society presentation, like maybe 2019 if I got that date right, I think so. And essentially, you're following and you're looking at three major variables uh, or dimensions of appeal for a specific tree. So the first dimension is taper, because that's how you create that surreal effect of this thing that's under a foot to be 20 feet tall, and or whatever the right proportion is, something that's 18 inches to be 100 feet tall. It all comes down to the taper, or the thickness to the thinness, as you go from the, the base to the apex. So that's one dimension. So I have like a chopstick with one red mark, uh, mark on it for that. For the second dimension, it's movement. So I have a chopstick here for the movement with two marks on it. And essentially you're looking at from, from inner node to inner node, from the nibare to that first branch. You know, where do you, what front or where would you see the most movement? And then to go from that first branch to that second branch, you know, where's that most, most dramatic movement? So you're essentially going to find the front that has the most movement, and that's going to be your second choice or second dimension. And your third dimension is going to be special features or characteristics. So for these, like wherever you might have um, lots of back and forths, wherever you might see you know, either a flaw or a characteristic, you know, how would you address that flaw? How would you hide that flaw, correct it? Or how would you pull out a special characteristic if there was like some really gnarly deadwood somewhere or if there was a spot that had a lot of eccentric movement or 
like a really cool Tenjin or Topjin or something of those natures. Those are all potential special characteristics that you'd want to consider when you're looking for your objective design. So for this specific tree, uh, we're going to look first and foremost for the taper. So I'm going to take my root pick and just kind of comb out some of the soil that's holding at the top roots just to help see if the base of the tree actually starts a little bit lower than where I currently have it set. And what I mean by that is like I can see some roots starting to pop out here and here and, and here. So I know that like maybe those roots will end up being the nabare or the top, the top roots to set the design on. But it could be that you dig down and you don't find any fine roots or any like lateral roots until you get another inch down below, which might unveil some movement or some extreme taper points that you'd want to factor in that would be under the soil line if you didn't do some of that. So there's a specific part, and I know it's hard to see without being here in person, but there's a specific part where there's a nice big root that connects to the trunk line in this area. So I'm thinking like I really enjoy this, this root exposure. So probably consider some of this as the beginning basis. Now, like I mentioned earlier, these uh, have a lot of movement and not a lot of taper. So, but they're different for everyone. I saw a few other ones that had some extreme taper in there. Um, so for this one, Okay. <laughs> that's a, that's a, I mean, that's okay. You, you'll want to play into that. So when you're considering like what, what front of the tree shows off the, the most taper, that's kind of what you're looking at first. Go ahead. So I, I feel like for this specific tree, somewhere in this direction, from over here, where you can see those Nabari lines, and then you can see these other Nabari lines on the backside, like where, so you get this full sprawl, is probably where like you're getting the most taper, at least from the, from the root base and then you don't see much of the reverse taper on the way up. So I think from like a front of this tree, this is like a, probably where I'd want to showcase like that taper dimension. So if I was only going off a of taper, this would be the front of the tree. Now you lose a little bit, so I'll set that over to you. So it would be the front like over here. So with that, you lose a little bit of the movement. So then that will do that for the second one. We'll, we'll consider where the movement is. So I'll use my second chopstick to kind of go through and see where do I see the most movement. And also some things to consider. Um, your tree should have the apex coming towards you for your front. So you always want your apex to come at you instead of falling away from you. So that's something to consider. And then you're definitely not beholden to the way that the tree is currently potted in the container. Uh, I did, whenever I up pot them, try to find more compelling angles and uh, directions than they were initially potted. But with that being said, you know, ver there's no reason why you know this tree couldn't you know move into this direction or drastically you know shift depending on what the opportunities were. So keep that in mind when you're looking at you know what's the front that might show off the most movement. You might have to angle your tree up on blocks or something, um, which I actually didn't bring any blocks, but we can find something if we need it. Oh, I have plenty of extra wood. On the other side of the pool? Yeah. Okay, cool. Can we go grab something? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind grabbing like just a couple shorter pieces. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. So then aiming for like which, where do I see the most movement? It's 
trying to study the tree and look around a little bit. This one's got a lot of movement, so it makes it kind of kind of interesting. So when you're thinking about your trunk line relative to the soil line, a couple things to try to avoid include having your trunk be straight up and down, unless it's a formal upright or it's like a uh, like a formal upright. <laughs> and also try to avoid um, like 90 degree or parallel lines to the soil, unless that's part of the design. So what that means is like if this tree, like if I'm looking at like, oh look, there's a lot of movement here. Well, I basically, if I repotted it like this, I just re reset the trunk line to be vertical. So you want to try to have the trunk line always go at an angle in some direction um, that's not 90 degrees. Um, so there's two options for this one as far as the movement goes. And it, then they're almost on 180s, which is usually the case. So from this angle here, you can see the tree goes away and then kind of loops back and has this presentation. It's not the first branch, but it is a presentation of a branch. And then the main trunk line kind of wraps back this way and then goes up and then spins around a little bit and then kind of would come back through over here. So that's one dimension or like one potential option is from over this direction. And then if you look at that same idea from the opposite side here, there's a branch in the way, which we were talking about removing earlier. Um, I'm going to do that now. But you would have your first branch be here, essentially. And then another set of foliage pads coming up this side. So I actually really like this front from over here. And I can elaborate more on that, but then you have uh, some apex options that are coming back towards you. Um, so I think this is a pretty solid front. So then I'm going to look at uh, special features and characteristics. So for this one, we have this, this specific juniper. We have the triple branch um, thing I was talking about earlier. When we were trimming, that's going to make an interesting gin. And then we have that reverse taper node at the top that we're going to make shari out of. So where would you see that from? the most? Where would, where would the shari of that show up and where would you see? So probably like if you're flat on looking at the tree from here and we clip this branch back, which I'm going to do now with some branch clippers. I'm essentially going to clip this a little bit further down and then we'll make a gin out of it by just removing all these green growths. Uh, you, you got my attention. What's the, what was the question? I'm sorry. Totally. Valid question. I was going to get into those specific details later, but yeah, I'm happy to happy to elaborate on them. So essentially, and I don't have an example of one here, but we can we can dive into it now because I just cut one. So essentially, like a, a gin is what we're describing and using as a, as a Japanese word for a dead branch. So you're really trying to embody like the age and the elements that go into like making a, a really old tree. So like when you think about old trees, they have dead branches on them. And the dead branches are not usually very long because the elements just slowly beat, beat them back and uh, wear them down and fissure them and crack them and splinter them and open them up to where they're like kind of like points, uh, typically. So that's the definition of a gin. So like for this specific uh, tree here, this branch that I just cut was like about out to here. I mean, you guys saw how long that branch was. This thing was like super extra long and like kind of unnecessary for the top growth. 
So I cut off, like I cut it about halfway off. And then, thank you. And then um, left this long extended point that then will turn into the dead branch to call it a, a jinn. So from the definition of a shari, a shari is the, the ribbon that you see running down the tree. So like the main appeal and draw of a juniper comes from the interplay and the, the um, juxtaposition of the living and the dead. So essentially like junipers have the capability to where you can like carve uh, some of the trunk line and like remove some of the um, cambium layer and some of the bark uh, in a specific way to where then you can like create a line of dead like vein that rolls up the tree to like create the delineation between the living and the dead on the uh, trunk line itself and then that looks really cool so essentially like for this I could you know um, for this gin or this dead branch I created I could like start stripping away some of the underside of this uh, branch that connects to it and like create a shari that wraps around and then like keeps continuing to wrap around the trunk so you'd have this like little white line that would like go all the way around the tree and then it would terminate into this into this uh, here gin that we're going to make. So that's, does that definition help? Yeah, and I've got, I just like saying, I've got like a spit on the side of my trunk that I just like talking about. Okay, yeah, thank you. Totally, yeah, 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 absolutely. So I'll, I'll save getting into making of the gin uh, to the end because I think that's probably a fun part. I mean, it's all fun to me, but we'll just save that towards the, the very last steps because I'm going to jump into one, finishing off like now that I've found the three independent variables, I'm going to make a decision using these blocks. Thank you, Roland, for trying to understand where the front could be to capture the, um, the best of all three. It's going to be a sacrifice, right? Because if I'm only going for movement, it's this side. If I'm, if I'm only going for movement, it's this side. If I'm only going for taper, it's this side. And if I want the special characteristics, it's this side. So it's going to be kind of a give and pull between all three to where like, I, I recognize this tree doesn't have the most, the most compelling taper. So I'm going to put more weight into the, the variable of how does that movement and special characteristic dimension look. So going through that process, definitely gonna like land as a front just like generally speaking within this within this area let me see let me get from the camera yeah so within this area so the trunk line is going to kind of come towards the viewer and then you have some good branching that we can kind of pull to the side and then from there the trunk line goes away from you and then it'll all start folding back in on itself so we're gonna we're gonna rock it like this so that we kind of have a front picked out and it might change as we do some wiring I'm going to start doing some uh, initial wiring here. So if you have copper wire, copper wire is very effective with conifers and junipers at large. Um, aluminum wire also works. We have some ABS wire here, so I'll just pull from that. And um, how's your guys' experience with wiring? Not a lot. Okay. It takes a lot of trial and effort and you just kind of have to knuckle down and learn it. And the best way that you can learn is by doing. I'm by no means like the most proficient and the best wire in the world. However, I am willing to learn and teach you what I do know and what I've worked on so far. So from a basic wiring approach, you're looking to bind two branches together to where with a single piece of wire. And then from there, 
uh, you set that initial structure. So you're thinking a lot about the primary, secondary, and tertiary branches and how those um, how those unfold from the main base, like the, from the main trunk line. So I will follow the same approach as I did with the trimming and the pruning, where I start at the base and I'll move my way up. So for this specific tree, we have two branches right here that I'll bind together with a single piece of wire. I'm going to use thicker aluminum wire for this first uh, branch because it's a primary branch. Like it's the primary branch line. And then whenever I come back through, so I'll set a wire from like this tip all the way through this tip. And then I'll come back through and use a thinner piece of wire to wire the secondary branches, which would be like these two and these three. And then from there, you can come back in and wire all the little tertiary pieces to make a pad to flatten it out. So that's the general approach and concept that we'll be taking when it comes to wiring. So I don't know the gauges to this. This feels like it's probably maybe a four or a five aluminum wire, maybe a four. But nonetheless, how what I do is I kind of just take a rough measurement to where I will just kind of roughly see about how long that would that wire would need to be. And I had them right here. Okay, so then the first thing you do when you're applying the wire is you're looking to anchor it. So you want to anchor it to both of the branches so it's nice and uh, cinched before you try to wire out that branch. So I'm going to take the tip of the wire and wrap it around the back of the tree and feed it through. And then I'm looking at the length of the wire that got inserted around and I'm trying to make sure that length um, will cover that first branch. So. actually want it to go above that branch so okay so that wire is cinched around one branch and then I'm going to wrap it around the trunk so that it stays locked in place. I'm actually gonna have to feed it around through here. There we go. And then we'll lock it over this other branch. Okay, so now the wire is locked onto each of these two branches. So I'll basically just um, like let the wire coil around that entire branch structure, trying to get uh, like a 45 degree bend between each one of these coils. And with my left hand, I'm securing the wire against the, the branch. With my right hand out towards the end, I'm just slowly trying to like wrap it around that trunk or that uh, that branch until you get out to the tip. And as you're laying the wire down, if you're going to run over any smaller foliage growth, feel free to remove them or you can try to have the wire um, essentially go a different path. Like you can kind of set it back a little bit and you just clip off the remainder at the tip. I leave a little bit just for more wiggle room. So that's one of those branches wired up. And then we'll do the same thing with this other branch.
Sweet. So, got the first two branches with their primary wire on there, so that allow us to, you know, give like give a little adjustments here and there. So, like for instance, this um, the smaller branch that I just attached a, a bind to, it was very straight. So I'll put a little bit of motion into it to try to give it some upward movement. You want the whole you want the whole tree to have the same sort of motif or theme to it. So if you have like if you have a lot of motion in it, you want that theme and, and feeling of motion to be persistent and available and viewable throughout the whole tree. You don't want some part to have motion, but the other part to be very straight. So you want to keep that theme consistent because the brain will recognize the holistic pattern before it starts diving into the individualized components and saying, ah, that large curly cue was complemented by a smaller curly cue. So your brain picks up on the whole pattern and it will notice on anything that's like out of, out of um, adjustment or out of sync, if you will. So for this one, I'm going to try to keep that idea present in the branches to where we're going to try to create lots of motion in the branches. And um, bef before I move the stuff too much, <laughs> we almost lost Ruan in a table. That was fun. <laughs> AV table almost flipped. We're good though. False. No, no concerns. Uh, it was a real alarm though. Um, <laughs> before I do too much motion on the on the primary branch line, I'm going to just take that opportunity to lock in the secondary branches. So uh, on this one, you can see there are one, two, three, four secondary branches. So I can uh, essentially bind these two with a smaller piece of wire and bind these two with a second piece of wire. So I'll use two more pieces of wire on this one branch to lock in the secondaries. As I do that, I'm open to hear any feedback wherever you are when it comes to trimming, uh, front and design finding, and or getting into wiring. So I'll just do a little bit of wiring and keep my ears open for, for you guys. Hopefully the pace isn't too fast. Mm -hmm. I would, if the long branch is the apex, I would consider kind of doing what I did here, where like this, that one branch that I did cut that was very thick that we're going to make a gin. I mean, that was technically the apex branch growth that has been trained to come back down. So instead of trying to like continue the, try to try to bend that up to like kind of somehow try to make another layer of curly cues up here. I just chose to like cut it and then to make that a feature like a gin. And then now like the apex is going to be one of these. Of the, of, the, of, the, of the overall design because this is a very thick branch, right? So if you're having this thickness. If you have this thickness in the apex, then it's like kind of, um, it's, it's heavy, right? It's heavy for the top of the tree. So Rusty, I would encourage like, this design is going to be kind of a, a curly informal upright. Like it's going to have like a lot of compact movement, um, but it's going to like the apex is going to be directly over the roots. For yours, depending on how much it dips down, like some of those could lead themselves to be like cascades or semi-cascades. So if that's the case, that long branch could, in theory, be like the, the long leading defining branch in that cascade. And then, like in theory, like if you wanted to cascade from here, you could like have that go this way and then, you know, use some of this stuff to build your apex. But then you'd have like this longer uh, defining branch down there. Hopefully some of that helped with your decision. Okay, cool. <laughs> There we go. So beyond that, um, the thing I just said that triggered an idea was around the defining branch. So for this tree, like you want your defining branch to kind of set that overall canopy motion. So I haven't 
put my uh, branch in places yet. I was going to do the, the two secondary branch wirings. But I just wanted to let everyone know that like as you're starting to wire your tree, you want to find out which of these branches is going to be like the, the most relevant and prevalent like defining branch. And then you're going to want to set that one in place first and then start building your canopy layers um, on top of that definition. So let me put some secondary wires on and then I'll show you what I'm talking about. More questions if you have them. I'm open for that. There's one wire for the, or half of the wire for the first secondary branch. And there's the other wire. Let's do one more secondary branch. So I'm using something that's drastically less um, in the caliper and the thickness or gauging with this aluminum for the secondary branch. This is probably like a 1.5 aluminum wire. So again, just kind of going through the process of wiring, I'm setting that initial anchor point and then locking it in on one, one direction, and then trying to make sure that the wire is spiraling in the opposite direction so that as you cinch it, like you're locking it tighter instead of making it more looser. So basically, if one is going clockwise, the other one needs to go counterclockwise as you, from that bind point. If, I can elaborate more on that and show people if people want more, more words to help with that or more visuals. You want to try to make as clean and, clean and invisible wiring as possible. Sometimes, and especially as you're learning, it's just it's, uh, it's a learning process. So you, you can figure out better ways to have like less obtuse or less op like observationally available wiring. Like you don't see it as much. Less intrusive wiring. Okay, so we have wires set for this, this first branch here. So we'll kind of put some of this in place. So when you're setting up your pad structure, you want the, the secondary wire or the secondary branch to always like have a nice close in angle and it's going to follow the branch line and then it's going to uh, fork away and then the tips are going to get pushed up. So essentially you kind of want all your branch structures to kind of have that same flow to where that secondary branch is going towards the tip and then going away and coming up. 
So you can see here, these now follow like that same-ish pattern. This one could use a little piece of wire to follow that same thing. And then for this is the tip of this, like the primary tip. I'm just gonna have it a little more motion down and then kind of help it go up. Same thing with this other side, as we're going to the secondary branch on the other side of the primary line. Have it go in towards the primary line. Have it go out and away, and then tip it up. And then same thing with this one. So more or less, you can see kind of like a rudimentary branch structure set up within this, this first branch here. So you can see the comes up, the primary line goes down, and then it tips up here. Then you have your pads displayed out here. So now I'm going to come back through and just kind of trim up some areas to kind of thin it out a little bit where stuff's growing straight up or straight down now that it's all positioned. The reason why you cut the stuff that's on the bottom is because it's going to just naturally get shaded out over the foliage that's above it. So you're just going to you know, encourage the tree to grow <laughs> in the areas where you want it to grow instead of in the areas where it's just going to kind of peter out and die and have like less likelihood to provide strength to the tree. So that's the main reason why you're getting rid of that the downward growth stuff. It's very thick through in here. So this is where you would take an even finer piece of wire for your tertiary wiring and you could set set these tips to have their own space. Okay, so then I'm going to work on this set other piece of that <coughs> That second branch that was primarily wind, wired. So let's give it a little bit of movement. And then it could probably use one additional piece of wire. I'm going to bind it here and then Okay, so it's bound to the primary line branch, and then I'm just going to wrap a little bit around the secondary piece. Everyone here's paid their club dues, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, me too. I don't even know if I've paid my dues yet. <laughs> ah, get get him off the camera. <laughs> okay, so that second branch, I didn't do a whole lot other than kind of put a little bit of motion in this um, this first inner node and then put a, a piece of wire in the secondary branch to kind of help position it to where it fits next to, next to this other, to kind of extend this pad around. Like I was describing earlier, I'm gonna pop this little guy off the bottom. 
and then just trim it back to where it doesn't run into the other one. So essentially we got two of the branches set. Kind of fun, making progress. So now we'll move into this third branch. So then it goes back to, hey, how am I going to like bind this third branch? What am I going to bind this third branch to? So I have options. We got always got options. Just sometimes the problems are easier to solve than other times. So I'm going to take this branch and we're going to bind it out here. It's going to be a longer piece of wire. It's going to go once or twice around this trunk line and then it's going to follow this line. So this is where we get into that one special characteristic that I was describing where you have three branches all kind of emanating from a sim similar area. Go back to that other wire that I had that thicker, yeah, that thicker like three and a half. And yeah, we're looking to bind this branch with this branch. Woo 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 out here on the tips. So we need at least at least this much for this side. And then definitely probably like a wire about this long. Go a little bit extra just so so we don't lose it. All right. So I'm going to approach this um, this third branch. I want the wire to flow nice and easy over it. So I'm going to come over the top, and then I'm going to have it go and wrap around underneath for the bind. So I'm going to do that. Now it's over the top. I wrap that wire underneath it for that first nice snug cinch. Bam! It's in there. And then with that bind, I'm going to go ahead and bind the other branch so that way I can wire it out. Okay, so it's cinched. You can see it's cinched there. And then I'm going to take it one more time around this and then approach that other, that other fourth branch. One more time around the trunk. Then let's line that up to go over and under and over and under. <laughs> yeah. That's the nature of it, over and under the branch. So since this is kind of not the primary growth of this branch, I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue past that one and try to find that primary line with this primary wire. So we'll we'll come back to you, little friend. Don't feel insulted. And then one of these is going to turn into a gin. I want to take one into a gin. I'm just not sure which one yet. I think. What do you think, Roland, Summer, Ruan? Which of these three would make a cool gin? The thicker one? No, that's the thick one. The thick one as a gin or as the motion for it to keep the thick one? Because you could like have the gin go down here a little bit and then like set these other two like on top of it. So you could kind of play with it like that. Or this one could be the gin. This thicker one? Yeah. As the gin? I agree. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we have consensus. Everyone, <laughs> even even Ron says sure. We'll go with it. <laughs> I mean technically we'd keep we could keep them all, but consensus has been reached. Is the lighting too bright for my pale skin? It's like, I can see through him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, is it, um, stylistically speaking, I guess with more of a natural look, would it be better to have a gym that's like a lower branch that maybe was older and died and the growth 
levels above it or something like the top ranks coming up that, you know, was unsupported for some reason. And, you know, a more natural looking gin, would it be a lower branch or an upper branch or it just depends on how you want to style your gin? Yeah, that's it. Education a is a thing. Go for it, yeah. It's, what do you think? So, like, if it's higher, then it just means there are strong winds and that those branches, like, desiccated. I do like the... They dried out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, either or works. I don't know how well they can hear you. You may want to go. Either yeah, so Summer, yeah, she was saying desiccation happens. Go ahead, sorry. So, just considering, you know, like you were saying before, the stylistic continuity. Yeah. And I like the way, I really like the way Summer thought about it because what she was considering was what's the storyline? You know, what's what's this tree's like? What's this living being's experience here? You know, what are we trying to tell with this with this art that we're making? And it's like, yo, this one got uh, in a high wind area, so all this new foliage that kept pushing out every year it got desiccated through the wind and the heat, so it all dried out and died. And you had the lower foliage persevere and slowly grow over time. So then you'd have like, you know, uh, very fine deadwood up here with like thicker branching down here. Or you could approach it from the other way, like you're saying and say like, hey, um, the snow kept killing all the lower branches. So even though they're thicker and heavier, the snow kept crushing them down and you just every year have like this new finer growth that's growing out on top. So you'd have like all these crazy like living things that are interacting with the deadwood set underneath it. So I've seen I've seen it both way. I, I would think the natural approach is, is either one as long as it's consistent and then like it logically makes sense from like the storytelling standpoint. Great, thank you. Have yeah. Good no problem. So the consensus branch was is hard to wire. <laughs> 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 the thicker one was all I got where the flow of the wire was going, but that's okay. I'll make it happen for you guys. So I cut off all the foliage of that thicker branch. And this stuff, if anyone like um, really wanted to, you could definitely like make cuttings out of all these things like very easily, just like bloop, and then that would turn into a tiny plant. So just something to keep in mind for all the enthusiasts. Bloop. Tiny little trees. That's what we're all after is the tiny trees. Yep. Exactly. I made my daughter do all my cuttings. <laughs> <laughs> I make her water them too. Good. Cool. Well, I got that branch almost fully wired. It was tricky. Over and under. <laughs> Just teasing. This will do a cut off day. <laughs> oh, wax on. <laughs> wax off. Kick that off. Show me under. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to have this gin that goes underneath, and then we got this uh, this thinner branch, which is a good choice just for everyone's uh, consideration. Whenever you have options, you're really wanting to favor the thinner over the thicker to help promote and encourage the taper. So wherever you have that opportunity, like I did at the top, to cut the thicker branch and grow it into the thinner branching, that's going to help with the overall presence and taper of the tree. So now we have two gins that we get to work on here in a little bit, uh, still on the secondary wiring of branch three and four. So we'll, I'll pause there for comments, thoughts, and words as I get into the secondary wiring. One thing that you can do on the gins, um, especially when you're creating them today, so like this is a, a strong consideration, is um, they're going to dry out and harden because they are living tissue. So when you make those cuts, you're definitely like have a small window of opportunity to do a couple things that if you don't do them now, it's like harder to do later. So those things include um, one stripping of the, the bark. It's really easy whenever you make a fresh cut on the gin. 
um, and it's kind of more challenging whenever you wait because it'll dry out and the bark will like stick to the tree. We're coming up here on that last 30 minutes and I'm happy to stick around beyond the three o'clock time frame. Um, so I just wanted to make sure topically we cover all the bases. So I'll do secondary wiring and then I'll get into the gin uh, talk a little bit more. But the other idea beyond the bark removal for the gin is that you could, and I have done this before, you can wire it after you remove the bark and strip the bark off of it and uh, kind of put some motion into any like long straight parts and or um, make, them, make them have extra curls. So you can essentially like wire it out um, and then it'll help help motion be in that in that branch as it dries. You can also do that uh, like if I kn knew I wanted to keep this branch and gin it in the future I could have left the green and growth on it and then put that bend and wire in it to then gin it on the next one. So there's a couple options just keeping those those considerations in mind. Okay locking in the primary wire on branch three. This guy, uh, I think Summer said she's going to send out a, a survey, but generally speaking, you know, is this format working for everyone? Are we feeling like, you know, having a little bit of guidance is, is beneficial or you just wish you could just roll through this on your own or kind of what are you guys thinking about this format? All right, so branch three has a primary wire on it. Throw some secondary wires on branch three and branch four. So there, um, one thing that you can do with secondary wires, like these two branches are pretty close. So what I will do is kind of do two wires at once. So I'll cut two wires to be the same length. Essentially, I'll just, because I'm going to want to wire um, these two branches with one end of this, of this wire, and then I'll um, have it extend out to these other two to cover those four branches. And then there are two more on the interior that I'll cover with a third piece of wire. So for branch number three, uh, we're going to put three secondary wires on it, and I'm going to put two on at once. Think about how I'm going to approach this. Okay, so one of them is fixed on there. Okay, and the other one. Locking those secondary wires in place. And it's okay if your wires cross. Um, a lot of people have the taboo of no wire crossing. It has to be a perfect wire. And sometimes, you know, it's all about the tree. 
So if you need to cross some wires to get the right approach, it's not the end of the world. It goes back to what I was describing as far as you know having aesthetically pleasing wiring and then at least being conscious and aware of wanting to have a beautifully wired tree and then you know trying your best every situation that you can to put on the most beautiful wire you can. Sometimes it just doesn't work out and as long as you're not killing the branch, which is the ultimate party foul here with wiring, then uh, you, know, you put a little bit of motion in it, it'll grow out, it'll lignify. That wire will help the branch stay in that spot where you want it to directionally. And then you, know, you can come back <laughs> later and adjust that. So just some, some grace if you need it as we all learn how to handle these, these bonsai. Special thanks to our camera crew here. We've got Ruan, who's the current secretary of the club. Woo. He's definitely rocking the multicam, multi light, and he's got like a mixer and an analog switch. And I'm, I'm like professionally mic'd here. He even did my hair, so <laughs> it's pretty. <laughs> just kidding, but um, it's very, very. Very well done, Ruan. So, you know, you're going to take this club to whole new worlds. So, thank you. Kate? Next time you'll have some makeup. <laughs> what do you mean? It's not working? <laughs> I told her. Exactly. Glitter. Yeah. That sounds really cool. Okay, so I'm on branch four. Looks like there could be. Um, probably one secondary wire on branch number four, maybe two, probably two. So we'll do two secondary wires here. But this branch definitely, when you look at it, like this is a secondary branch, we're going to have to put a bunch of tertiary wire on it if we want all those things to pad out. So we might get to that today. We might not. Depends on what our fearless leaders want to do with this tree moving forward. I imagine this one might show up in the ABS um, auction this year, potentially. So I might take it home and finish the tertiary branch wiring or whatever, whatever one has time and in, in, in interest in. You guys have any questions on your end? Any, any unique situations that you're running into where you're like, what do I do? Why is this happening? This tree is hideous. Or Sure. Um, I had to do, well, I don't know if we're going to see it. It looks okay. very rough, big bass, but everything's going down. Mm -hmm. So I had to really just work this up, just really doubling up on any big wire. Yeah. But now, how, I don't really have a lot of branches that are, um, you know, staggered where I can connect one to the other. So it's like, how should I keep the branch to wire it? Where is that going to come? What do you call it? Interior wire. I can we we can see it well uh, actually. Someone Ruan helped by putting your tree on the main screen, so I can see it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you're saying there's not a, like not many options to bind two branches together. Yeah. So mm -hmm. say like I have this branch right here. Yep. And I would like this branch to come to the back. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So you have two. Yeah, totally. Two options for that one. Um, and I can show you because this branch is going to be wired alone by itself. So um, what Juan actually taught me one time, Juan Andare, he showed me how you can use a single wire on a branch. And it was really rad. And I was like, dude, that was cool. I didn't think about that. So essentially, you take the length of the branch and you double it. And then what you're going to do is essentially um, bind the branch to itself. So um, what you do here is like take that U 
and like wrap it around the like the base of that trunk line. And then one side is going to go clockwise as far as around that branch. So like kind of roughly speaking, let me bind it. So there's one bind going clockwise. And then you're going to take the other U and you're going to go counterclockwise or the opposite direction. And whenever they roll across that branch, they're actually going to go on opposite sides. So like as I extend all this wiring out to the very tip, Exactly. Yep. They'll just be on the alternate face of that of that branch to where. Yep. And then you have like the double reinforced wire. So you have like two wires on that branch, but then it's also like locked to itself. So that's one option that you can do is to do that like single wire um, just wrapped around twice. Uh, another option that you can do is simply so you can see as I go all the way through like it, they didn't they didn't ever touch. So now that branch is essentially wired with a single piece of wire that just wraps around that um, where that uh, hits the trunk line. So the other thing that you can do, Morgan, is essentially like use a piece of wire and you can kind of just like sneakily bind it to the, to the um, primary trunk line. And then if you're going in the opposite direction, you know, you can kind of just get that in place. So what I did up here, just briefly speaking, is like, it's just kind of like fitting and wrapped around that main trunk. So you can essentially just like do like almost like a full circle wrap around the trunk and then extend it out into the, to the branch. You just have to be, whenever you're positioning that branch in place, you have to be mindful to just hold the trunk bind to like let your branch move into place. You're just trying to anchor, find an anchor point. So you can, I'm not sure if I explained that very well, but you can anchor onto the trunk and then. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, man, for sure. So you can do either of those. I've seen a lot of the loose end ones. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to like be as effective and you really have to look at the physics of it to where you're like getting that right torque. Mm hmm but Exactly. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I only got that when Juan was in my house one day when we first had him um, out like in 2016. So he like stayed at my house and did a little bit of private study with me and showed me how to wire a Japanese maple. And I was like, how are you going to do that? And he definitely like rocked that double helix thing that you're talking about. And I was like, dang, that's, yeah. that's cool, Juan. <laughs> you're good at this. <laughs> yeah. So continuing to put the secondary branches in place for this third third branch. The fourth branch is pretty much already set. And what I'm aiming at here for this one specifically is to kind of like extend the foliage pad of that already existing branch. Because this little branch by itself is kind of low. So I'm kind of thinking about having the, the pads just like kind of flow around that back side of the tree. So if it's looking in this general area, you can see these pads now I like kind of have some continued like continuousness to them as it will fill out they'll just get a little bit fluffier and have their own little defined detail so i've mostly worked my way through the lower two-thirds and it's up into the the apex so i'm going to finish the secondary branch placement on number four and then 
Looks like I need one more wire here. And then, yeah, we'll move into some gin creation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good though. That's really good. I mean, you got to adapt your design with how the tree evolves and what the tree gives you and how the tree responds with what you do. And then additionally, like the more information you have, the better the decision's gonna be. So if you've cleared stuff, if you've pruned stuff and wired stuff and put stuff in place, like the complete opposite side of that, the 180 degrees is always gonna, like it's, you're gonna get the same feel just on the opposite side. So yeah, I would say you, like you're following the right patterns and that, that's a normal occurrence to where <laughs> you'll think one thing and then spend time with it and be like, you know what, actually, we're gonna switch it up and there's no, nothing wrong with that. Because you're just trying to find the best for the tree. So these will all lay out this way. Okay, so for the, the gin creation, let's talk a little bit about that. So essentially, the tools that I'm going to use here involve branch splitters. So they're these tools that are straight, so the pinching is like when it cuts is going to like separate evenly and you don't have any curling. So th these are very important. And then we'll use uh, needle nose pliers. Or these are like gin pliers specifically from Jonas. But essentially, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is strip off all the bark. So for this top, this top gin that we're gonna work on, I'm just gonna take these pliers and squeeze, squeeze the tissue to kind of loosen that up. And then you should be able to just peel off like that outer bark to create that first gin and you just and it's really fun because you're just like peeling away that um, that outer bark tissue and it just kind of like peels off and like makes it nice and smooth and a very big color change one thing you will want to consider is like up here at the top to maybe do some basic scoring so that way you don't peel too far and actually cause damage to the parts of the tree that you want. So if you just put a little line or cut where you want it to stop, then the peeling will just stop there. So that's one little tip to help make sure that you don't overextend your, your peeling. But essentially, if you think about it, that would be like if you did overextend your peeling, then that was how you'd start to create some shari related to where this gin shows up on the trunk. I mentioned a little bit earlier, but dead branches on trees, they're gonna be beaten up and taken back and they're not gonna be very long because if it is a dead branch and it's very long, it's a young dead branch. We're trying to create the, the feeling of age. So with the feeling of age, as a goal, you essentially want to make sure that there's some degree of taper in the thickness of the branch as it emanates from the trunk all the way out to the tip. So like for this one specifically, and you can see how well did I score it? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, as you can see with this specific branch that I'm ginning, it's very much the same thickness all the way to the tip. And there's not a lot of like little secondary branches that you can say are compelling. 
So this gin will probably end up just being like somewhere within this, this depth because it's not a very thick piece of wood. Or this length, rather. So then I'll take the branch splitters, and at the very tip, I'll just uh, quarter that branch. To where you just split off little ends. Then what you can do with that is pinch one of those little quarters and then essentially just peel it to get like kind of a natural natural end. And I'll take the pliers and just kind of try to roll them and just get a natural tear and breakage for that tip. Because now, I let, so I peeled three quarters of that branch back, right? So now, technically speaking, that branch itself is it, right there is three quarters as thick as this branch above it. So that's really cool in helping to establish the taper of it. Unfortunately, it's still a little bit long, so I was just kind of using that method to show you. And like we could leave that if we wanted to, because it has the like the trifurcation interest. But again, that's a very long, it's a very long. Uh, gin. So I would do that same process about halfway up this branch with an attempt to to kind of keep it there. And I'll show you another little trick. So let's do that. Just practice. So essentially, we'll quarter this thicker piece. Didn't quarter very well. There we go. Cool. So you can see some of it already kind of peeled off. Let's take another little piece and just kind of Something like that. And what I was going to show you guys is essentially like how you can create like splinters and leave the splinter as an open extended piece. So it's not the best example. We have a little bit of a sharper, shorter, more dramatic gin up there at the top. So we'll leave that one. I'm actually going to quarter that little tiny secondary one because it's just a straight cut. I'm just going to half it and then peel it a little bit to give it a little bit of a natural, natural point. But this, this example is like um, a very older gin because it's jagged. It's got some more sharper, finer lines to it. It actually cuts into the, the branch a little bit down here, so that's really cool. That'll help set this one um, inner node that's growing up off of it out because it'll be like a little gin and then like a branch growing off of that. So that's that's what I'll do for this tiny little one up here. Um, do we have any time boundaries that I need to be concerned of or don't worry about that sort of stuff? Or? Yeah, so we'll do the same thing down here on this lower one. I'm just going to go ahead and start with uh, peeling off that bark again. Nice big squeeze with the pliers, and then just kind of peeling away the outer cambium layer.
This one has a lot more um, bifurcation, a lot more movement, a lot more interest to it. So I'm actually going to leave it a, definitely longer than the one above. This lower gin that I'm making has some natural taper to it because of all the bifurcation. And if you remember, we picked this one branch because it was thicker relative to the other one. So that'll be, that'll be cool to have like a powerful downward facing gin. Yeah. Unfortunately, you'll need like some specific tooling, like this sort of stuff. Yeah, these are like they're like uh, sharpened chisel edges that like are on just like a little rod. So I can easily like use this tool to scrape off bark if I needed to. And instead of using the plier method, like this just easily just tears the bark off the edge too. So like in that crotch region, you, know, you just kind of scrape along the edges and it pops right off. But you know, work, uh, you don't need any specialty tools. Like you could use an X-Acto knife. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to have specialty bonsai tools just to get the stuff done. Like I could pull the X-Acto knife out and you get the same razor sharp edge and you just kind of still do the same thing. So I would say work, work with the tool set that you have. Don't feel like you need specific tools to do specific things. The branch splitters are, are a, probably a really good choice um, because they help you like break that branch down into smaller points. So if you do want any special tools, I'd say the branch splitter. But again, these gin pliers, like needle nose pliers work and I use needle nose pliers for many years before I got a pair of gin pliers. So um, you will slowly and sure instead steadily gain tools and specialty tools over time and um, there's a dozen different things i've seen like a little loop like a sharpened loop that people use to scrape and that seems very effective i think like bjorn and mara stemberger really like those i just don't have one so i can't like speak to it mm -hmm. yeah those are really nice the clay sculpting tools Yeah, sure, of course. This is what I'm talking about. These are just like little sharpened hooks. So these these work really well for you know stripping off the off the bark. It's like peeling carrots. <laughs> I'm going to do the scoring up here so that I don't uh, extend this gin too far into the branch. Have you guys been doing any collecting yet? Any Yamadori? Very soon, yeah. Cool. I have someone bring in a crepe myrtle on Tuesday. I need to go get soil for that. Someone do a landscape. I'm not sure how big it is. But, uh, you know, regardless, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's already out of the ground? I'll take it. <laughs> is yeah, it? just hold it to dig it last. That's... I think the pliers are probably the most effective, honestly, for getting the bark removed, especially when the tree is like a wet cut, like you, like you just made that foliage removal today, because it just peels right off. The, uh, the scrapers and stuff, they work well, like whenever that bark is dried and hardened, or maybe like an old branch is getting the bark removed. So just generally speaking. And then as like the thing I really like about the shari making it really helps um, like add a, a new color, a new like characteristic to a branch and foliage pad. So like out here where we had three branches and it just felt really heavy, 
of like, oh, there's a whole cluster of branches all moving in and out, and there's this like strange um, feeling of denseness. Like, how do we overcome that? Well, you just take one of those branches and turn it into deadwood. What uh, what part of the like John? How are you doing, man? I seem to do okay. This is the first gen out of everything. Yeah. You doing okay? Cool. Are you doing? Are you uh, working one-handed? You got your left hand looked like it had a cast on. Oh man. Okay. Yeah, I got a broken bone in my hand. All right. So. <laughs> the first year I made one handed. <laughs> oh man, Brandon. Uh huh. Yeah, two choices. You can use the heavy gauged wire to put that dead branch or that to be dead branch in place. So you can like give it some motion if it's really straight before you gin it. So then like you do the whole like branch removal or sorry, bark removal and like uh, stripping of that afterwards. Like, you know, next time you work on the tree. So leave that wire on there. Or if you wanted to get the, um, the starting on the like the white aspect, you could just take that wire off with like a pair of wire clippers, right? Just clip the wire and um, just strip it. I mean, you can for sure. You can like take the bark off of it and then add a wire to it, or you can like strip the bark around the wire. I mean. Por que no los dos? <laughs> Why not both? So just finishing up on this. Ah. I've heard in the past about using lime sulfate. Yeah. Gym, yeah. Is that hard to find? No, not in the slightest. Yeah, lime sulfur, very readily available. Um, you can get it in concentrated forms. And then essentially uh, just do it a dilution to whatever uh, level you want. I've used it a little bit here and there. It works really well, is what I'll say. It's, it's a very strange process because it goes on very yellowy. And you're like, what am I doing? And then as it dries, it'll start to like gray and, and whiten up. Um, you definitely need full sun. Full sun will help it like stop being yellow. And then beyond that, the lime sulfur, like you can add like sume ink or some sort of ink to it to help uh, it be more of a grayish color if you don't like the blinding bright white. Also, depending on what your outcomes are, you can like dilute it specifically to have it not be as strong. So like if you just go 100% concentrated lime sulfur on that, it's gonna be like yellow <laughs> and then it'll whiten up over time. Uh, to my surprise, it actually does whiten up. Or you can add in like some of the water or some of the ink to like kind of offset that, depending on your you know your personal preference and your goals. What's up, David? Yeah, I can see. Just a sec. We're gonna we're gonna maximize the size of it. I just push the camera view, push it and hold. Well, like push and tap it. There you go. And then see how the option says pin. Bingo. All right, we got you on full full screen now. Okay. So 
so my mm -hmm. yeah. So I would say you'll thin out you'll thin out the apex a little bit here and there to help you make that decision. But what I see just from from this viewpoint is like you have two major lines that are going in the same direction and they're almost competing. So I would consider maybe finding an angular tilt. Yeah, exactly. Those two seem like they're very much the same thickness. Uh, the one on the left, from what I can see, looks very straight versus the one on the right with that curve all the way up. So I would probably try to keep that curve in there and then maybe consider what to do with that other one. You might be able to get away because jun junipers are super, super bendy. So a couple considerations is like, one, try to find like a different angle to where the, like instead of them being competing going up, like maybe one stacked on top of the other as an option. Another option could be to like um, take that very straight one and raffia up the that one part part of the trunk line that I see that's very straight. Yep, just like put a bunch of raffia on that and then heavy bend it, heavy bend it in one direction like later in the year whenever you have more um, flow of, of resources through the tree, like they'll be more susceptible to heavier bends later. And you could even consider like a wedge cut depending on how much you wanted it to move. But those, those things would probably help address like that uh, second to apex, like that penultimate branch competing with what seems like it would be the apex. Because you have this nice trunk line that's moving up and then coming back and sitting on top of itself with that spiral at the top, which is really cool. But yeah, the one, yeah. That one on the left is kind of competing pretty pretty intensely for my attention on it. So, like I'm saying, you could. Try to move it as much as you can, or you could either like you could even consider making that a very thick, thick short gin, and then like trying to to do a guy wire to pull that apex down to sit in between or around that gin as an option. So there's a handful of different like approaches and, and things that you could do to address it. And maybe you try to bend it first. And then if the bending isn't giving you what you want, then you could try to gin it and like adjust the positioning of the apex. And then additionally, the thing I also wanted to recommend was like just maybe an angle change slightly. Like if you just tip that whole tree. See, exactly. Just like that. Now they're not competing as much and you can e easily see uh, like a, a secondary versus primary like padding there. Yeah, man. That's sweet. The, the cleaning looks really solid on it. On some of those like denser parts on the top, um, just see where there's any like lateral things that make T's and like, and then, you know, try to like, if there's like three T's in a row, you know, you take the left one out, the right one out and the left one out. So you're then creating an alternating pattern with, uh, with that branching. Yeah. Yeah, if you would. Yeah, that'd be cool. If you go around this way, then you don't don't get stuck. So many things. Yeah, so this gin over here has like just tons of little ramification on it that it's taken me a minute to just like clear off all the bark from it all. <laughs> I just want to make a gin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would encourage you to do like a little bit of all of it so that you have kind of that experience and the guidance while you're here. And then, you know, in your own free time, you can come back through and, and enhance it. I've definitely styled a few junipers and there's no wrong way. I mean, there's probably really wrong ways, but what I'm getting at is like your approach is your approach. So if you do all the work at once, cool. If you incrementally create gins and move branches in place, cool. I mean, there's like, uh, I worked on it and created a few gins a few years ago on a tree and then like uh, got a chance to like see those like play out over time and then come back and like the growth filled in around those gins really well. So that was really fun to see the growth fill in around the gins that I created to where you're like, wow, this gin was totally like sticking out here and then the tree grew up around it. So you're like, okay, I feel more comfortable with the trimming and the ginning because I know that like how the tree is gonna respond and grow back over it. So the incremental process, 
the incremental process is, is a good approach too. So for this gin over here, I've cleared out a lot of the <coughs> a lot of the barking. And you want to try to make like no no cuts, but you want to try to make breaks, natural breaks, whenever you get down into it. So like for these tips, I'll just half them with the branch splitter or try to get a natural, natural break instead of that straight cut that's there, just to give it a little bit of a non-human touch. So you can say I split it in half. And then I'll take like one side and just roll through it. And just peel it up as much as it'll go. It shortens it, but then you get a natural, a natural break instead of the, the scissor cut there. In some places, you don't even need to quarter it. You just snap it in half or twist it around. Make sure all that bark is gone. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Okay. So we got our second gin almost done here. Feels good. Okay. So the next for me is going to be working on the the canopy and the apex. Just removing some loose wire ends there. Making sure all my branches look pretty. Now you can even create like little gins. Like remember very early on where I said there's a whirl of five. Like I clipped all the. I clipped three of them to get down to a bifurcation, and you just come back through. And just peel off the bark. To where I think it looks, I mean, it looks pretty cool. It's like a little detail to where you have like a little gin on the top, a little gin on the side, and I'll do that to the third one. So instead of just like these little dead things or trying to make cuts that don't heal over because junipers don't heal over their cuts, you just turn them into little features. All the little details add up over time. Okay.
to going to commit to not getting the tertiary wire done today, but I will do it before that you see this tree in the in the auction. Sure. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, it'll fill out. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I would consider. I mean, the the like where your hand is and further, like that section is very dense. So you could definitely afford to remove a little bit of foliage, and across the board, like the branch closest to you, and then the top still is very heavy and dense. So. Across the board, Morgan, your your tree is gonna be okay even if you remove the stuff that's unnecessary. So I would thin it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would still be okay for sure. Yeah, it, and that that'll feel awkward because you're like, oh, it's so thin, but then it'll definitely fill back out. <laughs> yeah. So we're back to adding some secondary wiring to branch number four. And then we'll move up to the top. So this branch is growing down, but I kind of like it because it's going to be a, a pivotal branch at some point with it being coming out, like with it originating out of this churn. So I'll keep this branch for now. I did reduce it to where it just bifurcates. It doesn't even really need wire because of how it's positioned. This looks like my next move is to take these two and bind these two together with some medium sized wire. I'm going to aim for like a two or a three at best and not use the like the four from earlier. <laughs> You're in here twice, huh? Yeah, I'm Okay, yeah. For sure.
Thanks, yeah. It's uh trust the process. Back to a little bit of trimming up or cleaning up opportunity where there was some bottom foliage growth. This is very dense. So like we were talking about earlier, wherever there's lateral growth that makes a T, we'll just pick one side and give it some space. Okay, well, just in case for something happens, I do appreciate everyone being here. Thank you for your attendance and participation. Hopefully your tree is satisfactory and turns out well. I'm going to keep working on this one until, until we run out of batteries or out of internet or out of breath or out of tree. We'll see. But I did just want to let everyone know, like, thank you for your, your interest in taking this remote workshop. It's a kind of a new a new idea for ABS to explore. Yeah, this is, I mean, I think this is a fine time, at least in Austin, to do work on junipers. Specifically, just the, the pruning, the trimming, and then creating some gin and bran branch reduction. As long as you're not taking off like more than 50% foliage, you, you're going to be good. And then you're going to want to avoid any heavy bends because heavy bends uh, expose a lot of fractured branch tissue. So then that's going to give you like a lot of little nodes where like freezing could cause damage and like uh, decay the branch. So. It's kind of the idea is like wherever you feel like you're bending it a whole lot, then you just need to provide some winter uh, storage for it or winter protection. But beyond that, yeah, you can work on junipers pretty readily throughout the, the winter time. Continuously finding where all the branches fit together. Just continuously to adjust the design and where the branches are going based on how the next series of branches go. Do secondary wiring on these two guys.
Yeah, it's crushing. Crushing it, doing the work. Uh. Yeah, I already threw some the wire on the part where I was thinking about like the shari being applicable. Yeah, we can. Let me see if I have a piece of chalk. If you would, a piece of chalk would help. I had one somewhere. Not sure where it went since I switched bags. I guess a piece of chalk would help for the shard creation. Basically, to uh, map out where you want to do that. So let's say, in theory, in theory, we wanted to connect these two pieces with a like these two pieces of gin here, like this top gin and this. Other created gin, the two gins that we created today with a piece of shari. Like I would want to look at, like this one's already coming through here, so maybe you'd map the shari out through here. And shari is like I'm saying, you're just creating a channel in the bark that gives the some motion and some help to that interplay between the living and the dead. So I'm going to use chalk to kind of outline where I'd want to put that. So it's going to start on the bottom of here and then go around because you want it to have some motion. And it's going to come into this section. And then that will actually encourage me to make a gin out of this thing to connect that to the shari that we're creating and then from there is the challenging part because the wires in the way but essentially somewhere within here I'd want to find what that next movement is to help break up this um, reverse taper that we have up here so I don't know exactly what that would look like at this moment I'd want to study a little bit more to make sure I don't make the wrong choice. So we're going to go for something like in this in this general area. So. Like the exposure to it isn't too bad, but I think I want the, like I might wrap around and then, so we'll figure out that piece later, but then for this other component, like I probably should have done the shari before I like wired all this stuff up. But essentially like I would just map out where that goes, where I want that to connect. So it would be the same process of like following like this path and then going around and then maybe coming up this way, finding that joint and then finding that interconnecting point to where that I want it to wrap around here and then come up again. You're basically just creating that channel of deadwood and like going through and saying this part is dead and then peeling that part back. So what I will do just as for demonstration purposes today is like work on this top piece since I know pretty confidently how that's going to flow. And you want to have a sharp like a sharp point so you can score it okay. pretty effectively. I have a box, box cutter that would help you. This will be just fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for this one, I'm just um, using the tip of this tool to puncture into the cambium layer to remove the bark in the cambium layer down to the like to the wood, and then doing that in a channel, in a very thin channel for this specific one, to where you're encouraging the growth of the tree to go in a specific way.
So then we'll connect that lower portion with an upper portion that goes on. Our, so it's like uh, spiraling around it instead of just a straight line because straight lines are boring when you could make it bend. Yeah. Oh, what's up, Jacob? A little bit of a vertical split on a thick trunk as if it had been in the world. If you kind of bend it back in place and wire it, kind of where it comes back together, I got a little bit of a vertical split on a trunk. No, that's totally okay. Yeah, like okay. the and you can actually intentionally split uh, branches at that trunk juncture to to give them some independent movement. You just have to make sure. A couple of things that you're super mindful of that spot being weak. So if you're putting a lot of torque or leverage on bending that, you know that you have like a weak uh, tear there already. So you're very high likelihood of like extending that tear, doing more unintentional damage than you wanted to. So definitely, definitely keep that in mind. It's not going to grow over, you know, like the, the living vein won't necessarily like heal that together, but it, it'll, it'll like, independently strengthen as, as the time goes on. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, man. You enjoy the day. I think we're probably going to wrap it up here. It's like 36 minutes over. So we'll wrap it up before four. <laughs> for sure. Well, yeah, man, enjoy. Thanks for. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just now connecting the like the wrapping around part of that Shari and I'll show you guys whenever I get it all kind of cleaned up a little bit more. So there's the, I added a little gin because of that shari choice. So that gin will kind of feed into that shari line as that develops over time. And I've seen some really compelling like work where like Bjorn created an intentional shari that from the trunk line went up and then did a like a river bend and then connected out to the first lower branch and he could have done like a straight line there but he chose to like carve out and channel this motion of the uh, dead vein to essentially make it have way more movement and that flowed into that first branch so it like helped create harmony and motion where that branch already existed but the the like intentional creation of that shari like really uh, brought your eye to it so it was a Pretty, and it was a very small cutting <laughs> that he grew from a from like um, a, like from a very small sapling 
that you know, wasn't all that like super impressive in itself, but then when you look at the technique and the uh, intent that went into it and the design, it, it was really came together well and turned it into a compelling little Shoheen uh, juniper. So. So it's not the best example, but for demonstration purposes and for technique and describing a situation, we did use this shari here to connect two gins. We didn't get all the way to the bottom gin like we wanted to because of the wiring, just from order of operations and doing this all live. But essentially, you have this gin here, and the dead vein or the dead channel that we created goes underneath and then wraps around the top of the branch a little bit. And we could even clean that up more to make it thicker and more prominent. But it wraps around the top of the branch. And then on the back side, continues on the top to wrap underneath again to then connect to this other, this other gin. So in, in practice and in, in technique, that's just the, the approach for doing it. So then like next time, whenever I unwire it, I would want to find a connecting line from this gin to this gin potentially to help um, divide up this upper flaw characteristic. So it's kind of, so that one's for you, Roland. Thank you. Uh, when I'm creating Shari, just uh, exposing that that wood underneath. So not digging in too much. Um, like I'm just literally, like literally scraping away all the living tissue, so that like the the branch can still survive. Um, but I'm not like carving into it or anything. Okay. So there are one, two, three, like a upper third to wire. So, so go and go to four o'clock. What's up? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So understood. We will come to a conclusion in a very short short order. Okay. Uh, yeah. No worries. Let's let's. Um, we ha I'm happy to call it if we need to call it. it we went except like over time, and yeah. Okay, for sure. We'll put some a little bit of wiring in here. I'm gonna take this uh, heavy top growth back just a little bit. Not even really worried about creating any gins on it because I'm just gonna like have it flow right into the like that'll just heal over and or this will grow out and you won't even see that little cut. But yeah, this is pretty heavy in here so we're gonna cut it back too. Since it's the apex, it grows the, the heaviest and fastest. So trimming it back is probably always a good choice. And you just find like little long leaders that are very long and just reduce. Okay, so let's see here. Got three big branches. Could put some motion in them.
So put some heavy duty wire on those top apex branches that are kind of heavy and thick and we'll just give them some downward motion. Since they're not the apex. Still a little bit more wiring to do on this one, but essentially got some interest in here. If you want the view, it'd be like from this direction, you can see like the trunk lines, a lot of movement. That was one of the initial fronts that we picked out. And then over in this direction is pretty, pretty interesting. So we'll leave it at that for the day. Like I said, uh, in conclusion, we'll probably see this tree show up in the ABS um, auction later in the year, and I will finish up on the wire.